Okay, so um, welcome to everybody. Um, as I said before, my name is Professor Aaron Mayer. I'm an archaeologist at the Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Bar Ilan University. Um, my uh, general topic that I deal with is the archaeology of what we call the biblical period or the bronze and iron ages. And I've directed the excavations at the site of Tel Asafi, biblical Philistine Gat, the home of Goliath, according to the Bible, for the last almost 25 years. Um, we were supposed to be out in the field again this summer in uh, late June and July. Unfortunately, this little virus that is making problems nowadays canceled our season as well, but we hope to be in the field again um, uh, next year in 2021. And uh, let me say that anything, if you want to find more information about the project, um, read more about the, uh, the various publications and keep updated and eventually, of course, join the team and sign up, please go to the website, uh, which is gotwordpress.com, uh, got and there you can find uh, additional uh, information. And by the way, just before, about an hour ago, I put up on the, word, on the, uh, on the, uh, the site that just by chance, uh, this evening, uh, the Jerusalem Chamber Orchestra is uh, playing David's uh, Battle and Victory Oratorio. So if you want to have the musical continuation of this lecture in about two hours, uh, go to the, uh, the J Jerusalem Chamber Orchestra uh, website. Okay, so let's start. So um, Tel uh is one of the largest sites uh, from the pre-classical periods, meaning, meaning the periods before um, the Hellenistic and Roman periods in the land of Israel. Um, it's situated in, on the border between the southern coastal plain, uh, what we would call in biblical uh, terminology, um, Philistia, that's the region between Tel Aviv and Gaza, uh, around over here, and the area that we call the, uh, the Judean foothills. Those are the low hills that uh, are after the, um, the area of the uh, coastal plain, before you reach the central hills, that's the area of Jerusalem, Hebron, uh, uh, Ramallah, etc. cetera, uh, there's low hills in between. So that the, the site is situated just on the border between uh, this, these two regions. And in fact, it's also the, one of the five uh, Philistine sites that we know from the biblical text. And as we'll be speaking about, we know very well from the archeological remains. Uh, and it's the closest of the Philistine sites to the uh, Judean Israelite areas during the second, uh, the first temple period during the Iron Age. And that's why it's very, very important for the interface between the Philistines and the Judites uh, and Israelites. And we'll talk about this uh, soon. As some of you may have already heard my lecture, my general lecture on the Philistines uh, two days ago, uh, I'll be expanding on some aspects that I spoke about in that lecture. But on the other hand, uh, some of the general aspects on the Philistines, if you want to expand on them, uh, I recommend that you go to the lecture from two days ago uh, and you'll uh, get some more information. Uh, now, uh, before we go on, I wanna give you a very uh, cool um, uh, 3D tour of the site. This 3D tour of the site was uh, made by combining thousands of uh, aerial photos that were taken by a drone, um, uh, wrapping them together. And, uh, and uh, a student of mine, Noam Din David, this, did this expertly. And it produces an extraordinary um, view of the tail. And here you can see, if I stop it for a second, this is the tail with the, the upper part of the tail, the upper city, the, the summit of the site, uh, the excavation area called Area F. This is the ruins of the modern day village. Arab village, which was abandoned in 1948. And here we see the lower city. And if we continue, uh, we're flying uh, over, uh, imaginary flying over the site. This is the Eastern side, the side of the site, which we'll see in a moment on plan. Um, and here are the excavation areas on the Eastern side, area A and area E, which we'll be talking about in a moment. And here you can see very clearly the crescent shape upper uh, tail right over here and the extensive lower city uh, which we'll be speaking about soon where we have very very impressive remains um, from the iron age from the philistine uh, phases of the city 
Okay, so that's the, the virtual tour. And now let's go back to, um, to the, uh, um, to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And there you go. Okay, so here's a, uh, an aerial photo taken in 1945 by the Royal Air Force uh, of the site. And you can see here the crescent shape uh, of the upper tail, the, the still standing um, houses of the Arab village, Tel Asafi, uh, which was abandoned in 1948 during the Israel War of Independence, the lower city, uh, which is over here, we'll talk about soon, and notice surrounding the site uh, in this very clearly seen feature in the aerial photograph, this is the siege system that surrounds the site. And as we'll talk about it later, um, this is a siege system that was built by the Arameans, the Aramean army under Hazael, the king of uh, Aram Damascus, who besieged Philistine Dot around 830 BCE, uh, and then eventually destroyed the site. And we'll be talking about this soon. And here you can see on a, a plan of the site, the crescent shape of the upper uh, tail, uh, area F, area A and E, and a couple of other areas on the eastern side, the lower sea with the various er areas of excavation, uh, the, the siege trench that goes around the site, and area T, which we'll be mentioning also uh, soon, is where we have uh, a, a cemetery, a Philistine cemetery. So let's go on. Now, just to give you a quick review uh, of what's happening uh, on the site in the various periods. We don't have time um, to go into this detail, but I'll cover the main periods that we'll mention uh, during the lecture. And we'll start with the, the Bronze Ages. That's the early Bronze, Middle Bronze, and Late Bronze Age. That's when the, uh, the site is probably settled by Canaanites. We'll talk a little in more detail about the early Bronze and Late Bronze Age. Um, this is... Um, ends around 1200 BCE, and then from about 1200 BCE until 830 BCE, that's the, 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 the centuries in which the site is a site, a very important site of the Philistine culture. We'll be talking about the Philistine culture very soon. Um, then at 830, the Philistine site is destroyed. A few decades later, it's rebuilt, and this time by the Ju Judai kingdom, probably during the reign of King Hezekiah in the late 8th century uh, BCE. The site is uh, occupied by the uh, Judean kingdom for several decades and then apparently destroyed by the Assyrians, perhaps Sargon or Sennacherib, uh, kings of Assyria. Then in the later periods, we know of, uh, of occupation during the Persian period. That's the very beginning of what we would call in Jewish history the Second Temple period period of the restoration, the period of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, then during the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine periods, there's, we do have some occupation on the hill, but it's rather minimal. And it's a very interesting situation that we see at many sites in the land of Israel and in the Near East in general, is that sites that for millennia were settled on the tells during the classical period, they move off the tails into flatter areas. And that's probably because the, um, in the Hellenistic and Roman period, they built ex more extensive and planned out uh, settlements. So, uh, for example, at Telesophy, a kilometer and a half to the east, there is the Hellenistic and Roman period uh, site. But again, in the Crusader period, we have a settlement again. And in uh, 1099 CE, that's most of the periods we'll be talking about are BCE. Um, the Crusaders capture the entire land, except for the land of, except for the city of Ashkelon. And among the other sites, they build a fortress called Blanche Guard on the site. Uh, and this fortress continues to exist for a few decades. It's then captured by the Ayyubid uh, Muslims. And then the, uh, the site turns into a village, and this village exists during the Mamluk, Ottoman, and British Mandate period until 1948. And in the Israel War of Independence in 1948, the site is abandoned. And basically from then onwards, it's not settled. And in recent years, the last 15 years, it's become, or 
20 years even, it's become a, a national park. And as I said before, we've been excavating uh, the site uh, for almost a quarter of a century. And it's important to, to stress that our excavations don't intend to excavate this period only or that period only. We've been covering the entire, um, uh, the, the entire sequence of the cultural and human history and environmental history of the site. And we've uh, touched upon all these various periods in various ways. That said, I would say the focus of the excavation is mainly the Bronze and Iron Ages because um, first of all, those are the periods that I'm an expert at, one. And two, those are the periods in which the remains uh, are perhaps the most extensive. Um, so let's now uh, start in our, um, in our virtual tour through the centuries. And we'll start with the early Bronze Age three. Um, uh, a period which ends nowadays we know about 2500 BCE and uh, in particular an area E on the eastern side of the tail uh, we have very impressive remains but we know that this whole site the whole upper tail was uh, was settled during this period and in fact there was a very impressive fortification that surrounds the upper tail that was built at this period that we found in various uh, areas and if we focus in an area uh, E what we have here is a very interesting thing is um, we have the, the neighborhood of the, the John Doe's, the people, the regular people, the commoners. Uh, and this is a, a, a very lucky uh, find because very often to get to an extensive um, uh, opening of a regular neighborhood uh, in a, a large multi-period tell, you have to go through a lot of, lot of uh, later remains. And here, because of the slope, uh, we just had to uh, excavate through the late Bronze Age, and then we reached the early Bronze Age, and we managed to reach a neighborhood with um, six, seven uh, different uh, houses, with alleyways in between, with very nice preservation of the finds, and this represents um, the last phase or phases of the early Bronze Age city. Now, the early Bronze Age is an important period uh, in this region. It's the first period in which um, cities appear and they appear not only in Canaan in the land of Israel but also at the same time more or less in areas such as Egypt or Mesopotamia and for example in Egypt more or less at this time this is the period of the pyramids and this is a very very important period in the in in, in general uh, human history and in the land of Israel we see a mosaic of various city states very often fortified like uh, Tel Asafi which pop up at the time and probably represent the various uh, polities, the geopolitical entities, the kingdoms, the small kingdoms that existed throughout the region uh, at the time. Now, we had a lot of very interesting finds, but one of the finds I want to focus on is a rather unusual find. Um, uh, about 15 years ago, when excavating the houses of one of the houses, uh, the, the floors of one of the houses of the early Bronze Age, we found a complete skeleton of a donkey that had been deposited purposely under the floor in a pit as if some sort of a sacrifice. Since then, in the same neighborhood, we found more than five other depositions of donkeys underneath the uh, floors of the houses. Now this is very unusual for uh, several reasons. First of all, who wants to live with a dead donkey under their floor? It probably stinks. Um, but that's what they did, and it's probably some sort of a ritual, perhaps a, a ritual when you rebuild a house or round a house, you, uh, um, you, you place a donkey underneath. And very interestingly, um, the negative image of donkeys that we have today is very not, much not so in the antiquity. A donkey was considered a, uh, an important and prestige-related uh, um, animal in many uh, ancient cultures, and for example, the traditions that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey are connected to that. Uh, and another very interesting thing is that we conducted isotopic analysis of the teeth of, the, of, of some of the donkeys. And one of the things that came out is that um, at least one of the donkeys, perhaps two, was originally born in Egypt. And during its lifetime was brought from Egypt to Canaan. And only then uh, was it buried as a ritual deposit in these houses in, um, in, uh, in, at the Gotham, early Bronze Age uh, Gotham. And 
this is just a, a very brief under, uh, explanation of how we use uh, isotopic analysis, in this case, strontium, because uh, animals eat plants which take up the, uh, the isotopes from, the, uh, from the, uh, the bedrock. And this gives us a, uh, an ability to understand the various stages of an animal's life or in a human's life where he was, where he lived, because every area has a different um, uh, isotopic signature. Okay, let's move on. And we're zooming through the uh, chronological uh, timeline. And we'll move on to the late Bronze Age, which is roughly between 15, 15, 1200 BCE. And at that time, Gat, the city of Gat, is one of the important um, cities in Canaan. And it's a city state. And one of our most important sources of information on late Bronze Age, Canaan in general, and Gat in particular, are a collection of letters written in Akkadian in cuneiform that were found in the capital of Egypt in the mid 14th century BCE, El Amarna. And there we have a whole group of letters from all kinds of people, including a bunch of kings from Canaan, including the king of Gat, who at least one of them was named Shawardatta. And so we know the name of Shawardatta and perhaps also another king from Gat uh, in the 14th century. And we can build from this in relationship to the other side that Gat, uh, late Bronze Age Gat, late Bronze Age Telesophy was an important site. And when we go to the excavations of the site, um, we have some very nice finds. This is, for example, a, a plan and a reconstruction of a very large house, apparently belonging to someone who was relatively rich compared to other people that dates the rich, uh, to the late Bronze Age. And this is a type of building that we have at other sites in the region at the time. Um, here are examples of finds from the late Bronze Age that were found in the various areas at, uh, of where we reached the late Bronze Age in, in Telesafi. Um, for example, this is a very interesting phenomena that we have in the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age is that when you build a building, you put in a foundation deposit comprised of a couple of lamps and bowls, very often completely uh, unused ones. And this was some sort of um, ritual uh, to, to ensure that the house existed in, in peace. If you want, uh, similar to uh, the Jewish um, um, uh, thing that you put on the door um, and the, um, you know, um, the mezuzah, excuse me, a, a senior moment there, uh, and which to, gives a blessing to the people uh, of the house. So now one of the interesting questions um, is, was the late Bronze Age city of Gat destroyed at the very end of the late Bronze Age? Why? Because the next stage is the appearance of the Philistine culture. And one of the big questions about the Philistine culture is, was the, were the Philistines a group that landed in Canaan, as I spoke about uh, in two days ago, and did they capture all the, uh, the Canaanite cities and destroy them? Or did they land and mingle with the local Canaanites and at most destroy the elite structures they, uh, uh, in these various sites? And from our excavations at Tel Asafi, we don't have clear evidence of an extensive destruction of the site at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Rather, one or two buildings seem to be uh, destroyed. So that might, uh, again, connect to this idea that the, uh, the Philistines, when they arrive, didn't destroy all the Canaanite sites, but rather settled down and perhaps became the, the, the leaders of, the, uh, of these sites, but they didn't um, destroy them completely uh, in an utter destruction of the Canaanite uh, culture. So let's move on to the um, late, from the Late Bronze Age to the Iron Age. And the transition between the Late Bronze Age and the Iron Age is somewhere around 1200 BCE. Now it's important to stress that this is not an overnight event. It's not an, um, the 31st of, Janu uh, of December, um, uh, 1200, everything's were late Bronze Age. And on the 1st of January, 1199, everybody moved to Iron Age. Rather, it's a process that goes on for uh, a century and a half at least. And, and what happens in this process is we see the slow collapse and decay and change of the world uh, order of the late Bronze Age with empires and Egypt and Hittite Empire and other um, 
elements and international trade of extensive um, uh, uh, evidence of it, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, connections, city-states uh, throughout the region. And uh, over a period of about 150 years, the Hittite Empire disappears. The, Greeks, the Greek uh, palace states uh, are destroyed or abandoned. This is the time of the, the, time of the Tro Trojan War. Um, the Egyptian control of Canaan during the Late Bronze Age slowly is weakened until towards the end of the 12th century, the Egyptians withdraw completely from Canaan. And in, in Canaan itself, the land of Israel, we see that uh, over an extended period, the various large city-states such as Hatzor, such as Megiddo, such as Tel Asafi, slowly are either abandoned, destroyed, or the culture changes. And this is a, a very extensive um, e uh, period of transition. Now, at this time, we also have the appearance of all kinds of new peoples, such as the Israelites. The Israelites, the first extra biblical evidence of the Israelites come from just before 1200 uh, BCE. Uh, the Arameans appear at the time. And also, the, we start to hear already in the 13th century of the appearance of various groups who the Egyptians call the peoples coming from the islands of the sea, who the people that we call the Sea Peoples, and among them, this, among the Sea Peoples, the Philistines. And the best and most uh, nicely illustrated evidence for the early appearance of the Philistines comes from the temple, the mortuary temple of Ramses III, a king of the beginning of the 20th dynasty in Egypt, at the very beginning of the 12th century, around 1180 or so. Um, and in his, on his temple, on the walls in beautiful reliefs. He depicts all kinds of things that he at least, whether they happened or he wants us to think they happened. Um, but among the other things, he depicts a land battle that you can see over here and a sea battle in which Ramses III, which is standing over here, and his army and navy fight against this amalgamation of sea peoples. And among them, we have the, the Philistines. And uh, this is perhaps the, the starting point from which we can start talking about the appearance of the, Sil of the Sea Peoples in general and the Philistines in particular um, in the land of Israel. And when we go to the map of the land of Israel, we can see that in the very early Iron Age, in the area of the southern coastal plain, the area of Philistia, we have five Philistine cities and we know them archeologically, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gaza along the coast, and Ekron, and Safi or Gat uh, inland. Uh, this is the original appearance of the uh, Philistine culture. Uh, with time during the Iron One, they expand uh, to the north and to the west and to the south. And at the same time, in the hill, in the central hills, in what we call in, um, in modern terminology, either uh, Judean Samaria or the West Bank or the central hills, uh, that's where the early Israelite culture starts appearing. So basically at the same time as the appearance of the Philistines, you have the appearance of the, Israel, of the early Israelites. And it's important to note that um, most of what we know about the Philistines, except from archeology, span comes from the biblical text. And in the biblical text, we all know the stories of the, about the Philistines, um, and which are mainly uh, stories of confrontation, such as David and Goliath, Samson, and, and the various stories and ongoing interactions, most of them um, uh, as enemies. But in addition to that, you have interactions that show that they were neighbors. And it's important to remember that the, the depictions of the Philistines, which were written by the Israelites, whether towards the end of the Iron Age or even after the Iron Age, are describing the Philistines from the Israelite perspective. So one of the important aspects of the, of the archeological excavations of Philistine sites is it enables us to get some, if you want to color or flesh on the bones to add to the biblical story and the biblical ideological viewpoint of the Philistines and from the, from the Philistine side. And when we start seeing the Philistines arriving, we can see that the Philistines on the one hand have a very, very foreign culture with a lot of influence from various cultures abroad. Uh, we used to think that they were mainly Greek, early Greek, but we now know that they're a, uh, a Mediterranean salad composed of various groups from various parts of the Mediterranean who settled in the Southern Coastal Plain and 
settled along with local Canaanites and this um, amalgamation of various cultures and this entangled culture creates what, what we know as the uh, Philistine uh, culture. And the remains at Tel Asafi give us a beautiful view of the development of the Philistine culture from around 1200, the beginning of the Philistine culture, until 830. At 830 BCE, the site is destroyed. Now, the, the Philistine culture continues to, to uh, develop for another 200 years until the end of the 7th century, when in 604, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroys the last uh, Philistine city. But at least between 1200 and 830, about 400 years, we have a beautiful sequence of the Philistine culture. And here you could, for example, see the various phases of the development of the Philistine pottery, uh, each phase representing a different uh, chronological phase in the development of the Philistine uh, culture. A very interesting thing that we found at, uh, at, at Tel Asafi and at other sites, that when the Philistine culture appears, we see changes in the diet and in the food habits uh, of the Philistines, particularly the Philistines in the in the urban in the cities, the Philistine cities, uh, and for example, we see a an abrupt rise in the amount of pig bones and dog bones uh, at the sites, and this is very interesting because at sites in that are Canaanite or sites that are Israelite at the time, there is much less um, uh, consumption of of uh, pig meat and dog meat, and uh, it's though it's important to note that in the past. Um, scholars thought that, well, if you have pigs, it's Philistine. If you don't have pigs, it's either uh, Canaanites or Israelites. Nowadays, we know that the story is much more complex than that. And there were Philistines who ate pig, there were Philistines who didn't eat pig, there were Israelites who ate pig, there were Israelites who didn't eat pig. So it's not as black and white as perhaps thought. An interesting thing that we found, and this is an example of the, the modern side of uh, modern archaeological research, is that um, we did uh, a DNA study of the pig bones uh, from the land of Israel throughout various periods. And one of the things that we, we were able to show that the pigs with a European appetite, a European uh, a genetic signature, appear in Canaan at the time of the arrival of the Philistines. And this is very interesting. It means that some of the Philistines who came from Europe, that means the area of um, uh, modern day Greece, whether they came by ship or they came by land, or perhaps by boat, they brought with them squealing pigs in the ships. And this is something that, by the way, we know that very often um, um, uh, people moving by ship have ship have pigs in the in the ships. Why? Because the pigs eat all the garbage, they eat anything, and in the end, you can eat them. Uh, so this is, a, and probably these pigs arrive, then they escaped out and. Till today, the haplotype of pigs in Israel is similar to that of Southern Europe and not to the pigs in, for example, Iraq and Turkey. And this occurred when the Philistines arrived. And the same thing we can see with the, um, with the plants, that when the Philistine culture appears, we can see the appearance of new types of plants that were, are not common in the land of Israel up to that point. Or another possibility is the, the Philistines started utilizing plants that existed in the land of Israel but were not utilized by, by people up to, up to land. So, and we see this change in the diet, but perhaps also in the farming practices that uh, come from this. And it's important to say that these plants don't come only from Greece, but they come from various regions in the Near East. Again, an, an indication that they uh, the people were coming um, from not one place, but from all kinds of places and joined together into the Philistine culture. Now, um, as in many um, uh, sites, one of the nicest things to find is evidence of cult. And we've been fortunate at Tel Asafi to find uh, at least two temples of, from in various areas in various uh, parts of the tale. One of the, te one of the temples was found what's marked here in blue uh, in area A on the upper eastern part of the city. Uh, and there 
underneath the extensive uh, layer of the destruction of the site by Hazael, which is marked off in red, we have an earlier level, uh, or earlier levels, excuse me, which include a temple. And here you can see a, uh, a, a view of the temple. And with a little reconstruction, that's more or less the, the walls of the temple and the two, class, uh, the two uh, pillar bases in the center. And this is very interesting. Um, it, um, we have at least two Philistine temples which have pillar bases in the center, pillars in the center, which of course reminds us a bit of the story of Samson who knocks down the pillars of the, of the Philistine temple in Gaza. Now, um, this is not the Philistine temple that Samson knocked down. This doesn't even tell us that the Philistines, uh, the story of Samson and, and the temple of Gaza even happened. But what it does tell us perhaps is that the image of what a Philistine temple was known to the person writing the story. So this is a very interesting aspect uh, of, this, uh, of this find. Another interesting aspect is right next to the temple, we found remains of uh, a metal production area. And as I spoke about in the last lecture, um, metal production and production of other various objects is very, very often found next to a temple because you need objects in the temple so you, you have an area to produce them. And this is also very interesting because it tells us that the Philistines were making metal. And we know the story uh, in the book of Samuel that supposedly the Philistines had a monopoly on uh, metal production, which is not true because many Israelite sites have uh, metal as well. But here and in another part of the site, we have evidence of the, uh, of the, of the importance of metal production at the time at Tel uh, in the 10th and 9th century uh, BCE. Now, as I explained uh, two days ago, one of the big questions in Philistine research is where and how do the Philistines bury their dead? And as I always stress, there's one thing that's for sure that we can be 100% sure that the Philistines died. We know that without any uh, doubt. Uh, the problem is, is that up until now, um, until very recently, uh, at the major Philistine sites, there weren't cemeteries. And just in recent years, we found evidence of a cemetery at Gat, and, and they found evidence of a cemetery at Ashkelon, and perhaps another cemetery at a site called Tel Um And uh, the picture is getting much more interesting and much more developed. And we excavated a tomb at Tel Safi with some very, very interesting uh, remains. Unfortunately, um, there are apparently quite a few tombs in the cemetery. So far, we've only excavated one of them. It was partially raw, but nevertheless, we had some great finds. And the finds, in addition to the, um, the pottery, the figurines, the uh, amulets, etc., cetera, um, there was uh, human remains. And from the human remains, we could study about uh, their genetics, their isotopic analysis, what they ate, what their health was, etc. We had a very nice picture of what's going on. And hopefully, we'll expand the excavation of the cemetery in the future. And I, as I as I said two days ago, one of the most promising directions in the uh, research on the Philistines in the next, I would say, decade or so is the excavation of um, more cemeteries of the Philistines and the application of cutting edge modern archeological uh, techniques in the analysis. And I think this will give us a, uh, uh, a real breakthrough in understanding who the Philistines were, um, what they ate, what their health was, what their relationship with their surroundings, and all kinds of related issues. Um, now, uh, the Philistines, at least part of them, came from areas far away from the uh, Levant, areas which probably uh, people there spoke languages which are not Semitic languages. And for many, many years, based on the biblical text and uh, names such as Goliath and Achish, King of God, or terms such as Seren, the leaders of the Philistines. It was thought that the Philistines um, spoke a, uh, a Greek-like Indo-European language. Uh, and in fact, they also tried to find evidence of the inscriptions. And unfortunately, uh, inscriptions in non-alphabetic uh, 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 writing systems. Unfortunately, we haven't found those. But what we did find at Philosophy is a small shirt about this thing, which on it, it has in very archaic alphabetic um, writing, and here it's written out, two names. And these two names 
are not Semitic names, but Indo-European names. And in fact, they're somewhat similar to the name Goliath. It's not the name Goliath, but it's a name that comes from the same general pool of Indo-European names that we know from other Indo-European languages, such as Greek, Hittite, Luwian, uh, etc. Now, this is very interesting because, uh, first of all, it tells us something about the inhabitants of God at the time. It tells us that the Philistines, um, within 200 years, perhaps, of the arrival, started writing and took Yusuf and started using the local alphabetic script, and they didn't bring with them uh, another writing system from where they came from. And the other, of course, interesting thing is the similarity to Goliath. Now, this doesn't, uh, as I always say, this was not Goliath's serial ball. Uh, it doesn't prove or disprove whether there was a Goliath, but it tells us that at God, at the time, there were people who came from the same um, linguistic background as we would expect if we had people by the name of Goliath. And this is very, very interesting. And it's, in fact, the earliest decipherable Philistine text. Um, but perhaps the, the, the most interesting um, aspect that we found at the site, wherever we excavated, and this goes on the upper tail and the lower tail, wherever we excavated, uh, we found evidence of this complete destruction of the site around uh, 830 BC, the late 9th century BC. Uh, and wherever we go, we found houses that were burnt down and collapsed. Uh, with, uh, with the skeletons of people who were killed in the destruction, with hundreds of fines, etc. And all of this is, co uh, is connected, apparently, to the conquest of uh, Philistine God by Hazael, the king of Aram Damascus, around 830 BC. And this is an event which is apparently very briefly mentioned in 2 Kings 12, verse either 17 or 18, depending on what version of the Bible uh, you're reading. And this is a very interesting uh, thing because um, it's half a verse, and then it goes on to tell what happened with Hazael. He goes to Jerusalem, and Yehoram, the king of Judah, gives him the temple treasure, and he leaves Jerusalem. And this is fantastic because uh, Philistine God in the 10th and 9th century, up to his destruction, was the largest and most important Philistine city, and probably the largest and most important city in the entire Levant, the, the biggest and most important uh, uh, city kingdom at, at the time. We have evidence of a large fortified city. We have evidence of international trade, etc. So the destruction of this city was a major event in the history of the land of Israel in the late 9th century. And since it didn't really interest the biblical writer, he mentions it briefly in half a verse, you know, just in passing. And so it's a very nice example of, of the focus of the biblical history out there. So here you can see one of the areas of excavation, area A, and the red lines represent the fines of the, well, the houses from, the, from this destruction by Hazael. And here you can see examples of the fantastic destruction uh, remains that we have. And in fact, we excavated house after house after house with hundreds of remains, very often vessels which they look as if they came out of the potter's workshop the day before. And um, it gives us a, a view, a frozen moment in time, sort of like a Pompeii-like event, not by a not by an earthquake, uh, not by a volcano, but by a destruction in which we can see what people ate, how they ate, what type of uh, storage vessels, what type of service, what type of coffee vessels, everything uh, that they that they had in their houses, and this is really a, a unique situation. And what's unique about it is that many parts of the town were not settled afterwards. And after the destruction, the remains were just left in place. So in many cases, when we started excavating right below surface in relatively good uh, preservation, we find the remains uh, of this destruction. And very interestingly, the destruction was so complete, the site of God was so completely destroyed that it was never settled again. And the Philistine city ceases to exist uh, from this point onwards. And in fact, we have evidence of skeletons of people who were killed in this um, conquest and destruction of the site, and there was nobody around to bury them. They were left out in the open. Here, by the way, we can find a, uh, a collection of various uh, vessels of various types. And this is a vessel which is very, very interesting because from within this vessel, uh, we recently managed to 
um, to find ancient yeast, and we managed to um, rejuvenate this yeast and yeast, yeast and to recreate uh, ancient Philistine beer. And it was very tasty, by the way. Philistines chose yeast well because this, this is, in fact, the same exact yeast that we use until today in modern uh, in beer, in most modern beers. And this was a, a great example of what you can do with the past. Um, now, in the lower city, we, we spoke about the upper city over here, where we had various excavation areas um, uh, with the various finds. We have an extensive lower city, and this lower city is, is settled only in the Iron Age one and two way. That means when the Philistines ran the city, ran the city. And this means that when the Philistines were in Gat, the city expanded from, let's say, 17 hectare, 170 dunam, or something like that, to about three times that size, to about 450, 500 dunam. And it turned it into the largest city in Philistia at the time, and the largest, probably the largest city in the entire southern Levant at the time. And this is a large fortified city. We have evidence of very impressive fortifications. And the nicest thing about the lower city is that after the destruction of Philistine Ga, the, the, the site of, of uh, Tel Asafi continues to be settled, but only in the upper city. So when we excavate in the lower city, right below surface, and sometimes on surface, we find the remains of the houses that were destroyed uh, by Hazael in 830. So we have an opportunity here to excavate extensive remains of the uh, of the, the city, but the remains are so extensive that unfortunately um, we can't excavate it all. And so here we have another temple that was excavated in an area D on the western side of the lower city. And here you find the various remains found in surface. Here's a great uh, altar uh, with me uh, kneeling next to it that we found in the temple. This was destroyed in the Hazael destruction. And then when we look at the various other uh, excavation areas, you can see that they're situated um, quite a distance from each other. And, and, and the truth is, even if I had unlimited time, unlimited amount of power, unlimited financial resources, and I can assure you I don't have any of the three, um, we couldn't excavate all this lower city. It's too large. And because of that, um, we started using remote sensing. And remote sensing, such as this method called magnetometry, or ground, ground, another one is ground penetrating radar. This enables us to give us a, a, a view of what's right below surface. And, and using the magnetometry, you can, one, find areas that are worthwhile to excavate, excavate. And once you've excavated, connect between the lines and the finds that you find in the excavated areas to, uh, through the uh, unexcavated areas. And based on the magnetometry that, that we did here, and this is a uh, these are the mag this is the magnetometry placed on an aerial photograph, and you can see here the, the the white and dark lines that you see over here. For example, you can see here very nicely. There's a series of houses with with alleyways in between them, and then we went and excavated right over here and right over here because of these very clear features. Um, you can see here area Y and area M, and uh, we'll get to them in a moment. And uh, we found all kinds of beautiful remains from the lower city. Now, going back to the western side, um, we have a, 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 a very interesting fortification and gate. And here, this is a gate which is situated right next to a water well. This is probably the water gate of the city. Uh, the entrance is some things uh, like this. Um, and the preservation here is really unusual. And the reason being is that right before the destruction of the city by Hazael, when the city was besieged, we'll see in a moment the siege system, uh, the defenders of Gath decided that they want to expand and broaden the fortification in this area. So they took all the houses that existed here, emptied them out of their contents, and filled them in with earth. And so because of that, the, the, the brick walls of these houses exist until today when we excavated. And what, what was fantastic is we found uh, a, a doorway standing more than two meters high, uh, that's more than, a, uh, than my height, um, in one of these walls. And hopefully um, next season we're out there, we'll excavate through this doorway um, 
doorways. I mean, we've gone to both sides of the, from one room to the other, but we haven't gone in the doorway. So that should be very interesting. And so this is an example of the, of the fortifications of the city. And here you have the various stages of this uh, very impressive gate and the gate goes in over here um, and the various uh, components of the fortification in the various phases. And then we move back to area, uh, to, the, uh, to the Eastern side of the lower city. And here we see a very nice example of what we find in the, in the, in the lower city. Right below surface, we find evidence of the last city that, of Gath that was destroyed by Hazael in 830. And you can see here a house and olive press and other features right over here. And right below it, right over here, we found evidence of an enormous fortification. Uh, and this fortification dates to before the 9th century. This is 11th or 10th century BCE. And here we can show, based on the very impressive fortifications we found here and in the gate we saw a moment ago, that the site of Gath, Philistine Gath, was a major fortified city already in the Iron One. That means not only in the 10th and 9th century, right before the destruction by Hazael, but Gath was a large fortified and perhaps the biggest of the of the cities in Philistia um, already in that, or at an earlier stage. And here you can see the fortification, which continues this way um, and goes on towards the, um, the, uh, the gate. Uh, we have a, an another area, perhaps hint of another gate, we're not sure yet. Uh, and in area M, based on the, re the results of the magnetometry, we started excavating and we excavated several houses and each house has an olive press in it and there's apparently an olive an alleyway uh, next to it and the finds in these houses were simply astounding right below surface we found complete vessels and you can see here uh, the smiling excavators there's nothing um, uh, having done this for close to a, a quarter of a century there is nothing more exhilarating than, than pulling out a a 3,000 year old complete vessel. And here you can see a juglet and some other vessels and some loom weights coming out and the various installations coming. And here you can see literally complete vessels as they're being excavated. And this is, uh, these are vessels from 2,800 years ago and you're just 20 centimeters below surface. And look at this, here's a, uh, a, a jar which is complete save for the broken handle um, and here, they're taking the jar out, you know, uh, wrapped up like a little baby. So this is this is a very nice example of the extraordinary, uh, well, uh, uh, extensive and impressive uh, preservation of the remains of the destruction of, of Hazael at Gath. Um, now, what brought about this destruction is the conquest. But how did uh, uh, Hazael uh, con uh, conquer the city? We know this uh, from the siege system, which we found surrounding the city. Uh, and uh, this was first found in an aerial photograph, and subsequently we excavated portions of the siege system, and it's an extensive uh, uh, siege system, the earliest known in the world, by the way, um, uh, more than two kilometers long, it must have uh, taken several months to, uh, to build, uh, all done in the midst of a battle, and after an extended siege when the people of the city were um, were, were hungry and thirsty and dying of sicknesses, etc. The Aramean forces attacked the city and clearly managed to break in and then destroy the city uh, comprehensively. And that was the end of the city. And here you can see uh, um, a reconstruction of one of the sections of the of the siege trench. Here you can see the um, tell looking towards the west. And this is the the siege trench. The uh, the burn that was created, one of the towers that we found, and these are the Arameans uh, besieging the site, and these are these represent perhaps uh, uh, the the Gittites, the people of God, who are trying to attack the besiegers, as we know, unsuccessfully, because in the end the city uh, was destroyed. Now, after the destruction of God, the uh, history of the city doesn't end; it just becomes smaller. It's never a Philistine city again. But we have several interesting phases. One very interesting phase is a few decades after the destruction of the city uh, um, by Hazael, we have evidence, and that's the ninth century destruction level. Then we have evidence of mud brick walls that collapsed, uh, and they collapsed uh, a few years after the destruction. And we know this because there was windblown sediments 
between the fallen bricks and the destruction uh, and the ninth century destruction. And right above them, we found two late eighth century uh, levels. So this means that perhaps the fallen bricks, which we see here and at several places on the site, were bricks that fell at some event in the mid eighth century BC, um, you know, first half of the uh, eighth century BC. And very interesting from the biblical text and from geological studies, we know of one or perhaps two uh, earthquake events in the mid eighth century BC. The most famous, of course, the the earthquake at the time of uh, a of of, um, of uh, mentioned in in um, in Amos book one one um, uh, chapter one one, and perhaps we have evidence of an of a very very significant seismic event that occurred uh, in the 8th century. Then, at the very end of the 8th century, we have an interesting phase of that when the site is resettled, but at this time it's resettled with material culture, which is very similar to the material culture that we know of from the Judite Kingdom, from sites such as Jerusalem and Lachish. And we know from the historical sources and from the Bible that in the late 8th century, Hezekiah, king of Judah, tried to expand the kingdom of Judah westwards into the Shvela, into the, the Judean foothills. And then in 713, Sargon II, and again in 701, Sennacherib, two kings of Assyria, they campaigned to this region and basically kicked the, the Judeans back towards, uh, back towards the central hills. And so we have a, a very temporary phase of Judite uh, uh, occupation uh, on the site. Um, then, as I said, the site is settled to a certain extent in the Persian period, but very, very little in the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine period, a bit in the early Arab period, early Muslim period. And then, as I said, in the um, 12th century, after the Crusader capture, Crusaders captured the entire land of Israel in, in 1099, except for Ashkelon, they build a string of fortresses around Ashkelon, including a fortress on the very summit of Tel um, This uh, this uh, fortress is called Blanchgard, the White Fortress, because of the white cliffs that you see at Tel uh, till today. And unfortunately, we couldn't excavate the center of the uh, of the fortress, the uh, the very summit of the Tel, because it's completely covered over. By a modern cemetery but fortunately in one of our areas area f we managed to get the very very corner of the uh wrong way sorry oh, um um the very very corner of the uh of the fortress uh and so we have an idea a little bit about the fortress and then after the um the the crusader fort is destroyed by saladin the ayubid uh the the site continues to be settled as a village uh, from the 13th century onwards until um, 1948, through the Mamluk and Ottoman periods, into the period of the British Mandate, uh, we have evidence of the various stages, including uh, a cemetery of the early mo modern period and uh, many, many structures of the Arab, modern Arab village that we find, particularly in this part of the site. And here you can see a a picture taken in the early 1920s uh, by uh, British archaeologists, and you can see that the uh, houses of the village still on the tail, and notice that the lower city, the area of Area D, Area K, etc., is almost without anything on it. So that's why it, the, the Iron Age remains are, are so well preserved. Uh, and here we can see the remains of the village mosque, which are situated in the center of the site, um, and all this was abandoned in 1948, and since then has gone through a, uh, a, a period of abandonment and uh, destruction, and the uh, stones of the houses have been stolen away, but you can still see a lot of the village uh, on the top of the tail. So, first of all, thank you for this very, very, for listening to this very, very brief uh, depiction of the, uh, of our work at Tel Um if you want to get more details, as I said, go to our website. Go to, you can contact me by, uh, by Gmail, by uh, AaronMayer at gmail.com. And also, if you go to my uh, academia.edu page, almost all the publications about the site 
uh, appear there. So you can get uh, much more information there. And of course, uh, even though we're not excavating this coming summer in 2020, uh, hopefully if we can uh, control this, um, this corona, uh, we'll be out in the field again in 2021 and you can all join us. And, um, and as I've said very often, thousands of people have done this for the last quarter of a century. Not yet one has said to me, Aaron, it was a waste of time. I didn't have a good time. Everybody enjoys themselves. So come, you'll learn about archaeology. Have a great time. You'll find great finds and it'll be something to, to remember. So uh, now that uh, we're finished, um, uh, Eras, um, uh, we can put on the, uh, 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 Eras, why don't you uh, start collecting? I see there's like something like 20 there something. Many, there are many questions. Okay. And send some of them to your chat because it's not problem with the English to understand them. Uh, okay, about the siege, um, uh, are there any other, uh, to how, um, how uh, regular is that to put such a siege on a city? And are there any other siege okay. like this one in Israel? And uh, another question uh, regarding the siege, how can we sure that it was surrounding the whole uh, site? Okay. So um, both are excellent questions. We have evidence of uh, large scale sieges um, in many periods. Uh, um, in, it's mentioned in textual sources already from the Bronze Age. Uh, we have Iron Age evidence, for example, the siege of Tel Asafi by the Arameans. There is an, uh, an Assyrian siege of Lachish in 701. Uh, we know the Roman siege of Masada, and we know of other sieges um, whether from textual sources of, or from archeological remains. It's a method that's been used uh, from antiquity and in fact until modern times uh, to conquer a city or to conquer a, uh, uh, a fortified complex uh, when the people, when the defenders don't give up. And now if you can storm the city and, uh, and conquer quickly, that's easiest, but very often that's not possible. So that's why they have it. And as far as how do we know that the siege uh, surrounded the entire site, we found the actual trench on the Eastern, Southern and Western side. And on the Northern side, they, they, uh, they connected up to the natural trench of the riverbed of the valley. And they didn't have to excavate an enormous trench on the northern side. They simply positioned their lines right on the other side of the, of the valley of the riverbed, and then they can close in the trench from all sides. Okay, next question, Eris. Okay. Um, there was a question by an Israeli tour guide who asked why are the sites at the Shfela, uh, Gezer, Gat, Bet Shemesh, etc. don't get uh, that much attention and money like other sites like Qumran or Mesada? Um, well, uh, well, first of all, all those sites that you mentioned, I mean, Gezer and Tel Asafi are national parks and they're, uh, they have signs, they have trails, uh, etc. Uh, and so you can visit them and you can get explanations. And um, uh, Gat is now in the process of being developed further and hopefully we'll reconstruct the area of the gate and there will be more uh, audiovisual points uh, in the future. Um, but the, there are sites which are, let's put it, say, sexier. Asada, Megiddo, the end of time, uh, uh, are much more sexier for uh, uh, tourists. And hopefully, um, with the excavations, with the significance and the sl and the slow but sure development of the of the of the site and the national park, more people will come. Uh, that said, I agree. I think people should come more to the Shvela. It's one of the nicest parts of Israel, and it has some of the greatest sites in Israel, including Tel Asafi. Okay. Next question. Um, there was a question, how do we know about the collapse of civilizations at the end of the late bronze, um, except for uh, what we know from writing? So. Uh, I mean, how do we know about the collapse? Well, yeah. first of all, yeah. archaeologically, uh, they've excavated um, throughout the, um, the uh, Eastern Mediterranean in Greece, in Cyprus, in, in Turkey, in Syria, Lebanon, Israel, uh, Egypt, etc., And we have found evidence of many sites that over a period of, as I said, 150, 200 years, 
uh, were destroyed, abandoned, changed, etc. We have evidence of changes in um, in the material culture. We have a, a paleoclimate evidence that during this period there was a apparently a an extended period of um, of uh, uh, of less rain, and that could be dramatically uh, affect you know affect a an ancient culture. And, and this fits in very well with the written evidence, which is extensive during the late Bronze Age, and then very quickly the written evidence disappears for about 200 years because many of the uh, of the kingdoms that had been using writing in the late Bronze Age either ceased to exist or became very, very uh, smaller, and we have fewer evidence of writing at the time. Uh, next. Okay. Um, now I'm passing you a question uh, through the chat, so if you can uh, read it, just a moment. Um, Again, I'll go to the chat. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. How many levels or phases? Oh, no, which one? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many... Okay, you can answer for both of them. Yeah, okay. You okay, okay, okay. So, how many levels or phases have you found from the Iron Age 1A period it got? Uh, well, this is uh, this is Michael Banya. He's a uh, he's more of a professional archaeologist. Um, we have about uh, two or three, um, and 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 quite a few sub phases as well. Uh, but that's that's for the experts. Uh, and then, how you consider the Philistines one nation, like generally presented in the Bible, or rather five separate? Si uh, cities. That's an excellent question. Now, um, most people in antiquity, if you would ask them who they were, they wouldn't identify themselves as I'm an Israelite, I'm a Philistine, I'm a uh, Assyrian, etc. Most often, they would identify themselves as I'm a the the uh, the member of this tribe or the inhabitant of this city. For example, when the Philistines um, are exiled by the Babylonians to Mesopotamia, and for about 150, 200 years, we still have a few documents which mention the Philistines who have been uh, who have been um, uh, exiled to Babylon. They're mentioned as uh, the person of Ashkelon, the person of Gaza. They're not mentioned as a Philistine. So now it could very well be that the Philistines had some uh, overall group identity of some sort, but I would. I would assume, and based on what we do know, that they probably, more than anything else, uh, saw themselves as the inhabitants of this city, that city, or um, one of the five various uh, Philistine cities. Next question. Okay, I'm going to pass you the next question also in the in the chat. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, so. Last time you said in the Philistine sites we found writing. Oh, no, one second, hold on. Uh, it feels like we found writings only in royal locations, but not poor family. How about that? Well, um, um, we, we found one royal inscription at the Philistine site of Ekron at the very end of the Iron Age. We don't have other royal, or, or we may have a very small um, one, an addition at the Akron, but we don't have a large um, royal inscription uh, at the other sites. I would love to find one uh, at Gat. Unfortunately, we don't have one, but what we do have at Gat is we have about 10 very small uh, inscriptions from the Iron Age, late Iron One and Iron Two A, which is more than any other site in the land of Israel except the site of Tel Rehov in, in the Beishan Valley. And the fact that these two sites, Gat and Rehov, have more inscriptions than anybody else might be an indication of the importance and status of these two sites, both as important kingdoms, but are also perhaps as uh, of, of, of sort of hubs of trade uh, at the time. Okay, now, um, next question, is that uh, possible? If there were other uh, sea people in the land of Israel. Um, okay. Um, for many years, people have tried to identify other groups of sea peoples along the northern coast of Israel. Now, um, the, most of the attempts to identify them are very problematic at best. And it could be uh, that even if there were other groups of sea peoples who did land along the different uh, 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 parts of the northern coast of Canaan, um, were very quickly assimilated into the local inhabitants, and they didn't 
develop a unique culture as the Philistines did. In recent years, um, scholars working in the Amuk Valley on the border between Turkey and Syria in the northern Syrian coast have found a few sites where there there's evidence of uh, sites of the early Iron Age, which have also uh, Aegean-related material culture. And it's been suggested by some that those are the northern Philistines. I don't think they're the northern Philistines. I think they're another one of the, uh, of the examples of the changes occurring in the Eastern Mediterranean in the transition between the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age, including migration of people who have connections with the Aegean culture. Um, uh, what's this? And Michael, again, I read early news concerning a change in the orientation of the building in the lower city of Gap. Um, there is, There does seem to be a change in orientation of the city uh, in the lower city between the Iron One and the Iron Two A. That there, uh, that the, the direction of the buildings uh, does change, and we don't know exactly why and, and what's the reason for this. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, that's uh, about it. Okay, so then let me just finish up and say that uh, in addition to the um, the excavation that I talked about and invited to come to, um, uh, Barilan University has also a, an international program uh, for MA students and for PhD students. And if any of you are interested in conducting your studies uh, in English at Barilan University, um, you should uh, contact us and uh, look into the possibility of, of conducting your studies. And the, uh, the program at Barilan University in the Department of Land and Visual Studies and Archaeology is very unique because we, on the one hand we study archaeology, we also study history, but we study the entire uh, the entire spectrum of the history of the land of Israel from prehistory till modern times, and it includes both uh, um, uh, excavations, as you can see here, but also a lot of field trips, as you can see in my in back of me. The, the, the field, the field trip going on right over there. Uh, and it's a real hands-on experience. So it's a lot of fun. And I, uh, I invite you to come join us, uh, get in touch with us, and hopefully we'll see you here in the future at the excavations and in our class. And I think I see there's a couple of more uh, chat questions. So maybe we'll finish uh, up with that. I'll give you another yes, of course, um, uh, make sure that uh, tomorrow evening at the same time, there's a lecture by uh, Professor Sean Zelagaster on Lachish, the city that saved Jerusalem from the Assyrians. And there's a continuation of, uh, of, the, of this program in the next few uh, days. You can look into this on the, on, the, uh, on the department website. And as I said, if you didn't manage to hear the entire series, all the lectures of the series are uh, on the uh, department website. And there's one more uh, question. Uh, which is your bet about God being the Judite city of Rehoboam? I don't think that God is mentioned in the list of Rehoboam, but that's already for experts in, in the Bible. Okay, thank you very much. It was uh, great speaking to you all, and I hope to see you again uh, in the excavations, in the lectures, and perhaps studying with us at Barlam. Um, bye to everybody. Bye.